There she is. Hello there. Love that smile. Waking up to a new week as the queen of tennis and onto the breakfast shows of America, Bromley's Emma Raducanu went. Michael, what's the reaction from your parents when you talk to them on the phone right after you won? They were just so happy and proud of me and uh, they're my toughest critics and very, very hard to please. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I got them with this one. I got them. They couldn't resist. <laughs> A deep dive into the archives and you'll see an even younger Emma Raducanu's fearless forehand. From being, in her words, the quiet one at school to featuring in British Vogue, her rise rapid. And just when you thought she couldn't get any more impressive, she unleashes her Mandarin. A marketing guru's dream, that ability to speak to a global audience could, many predict, make her the highest earning sportswoman in history. There is no limits, frankly. She's got um, a very smart agent who masterminded many of the sponsorship deals of Sharapova. Um, and she represents something really fresh and different in many ways. She's, she's elegant. Um, she's multilingual. She's got an incredible background. She is the epitome of the sort of Gen Z sort of personality. Now, tennis may have a bright new star in Emma Raducanu, but critics say there is no getting around the fact that for years, grassroots tennis in the UK has been underfunded and that for many kids across Britain, access to courts isn't that easy. In England alone, over 40% of public tennis courts are in a poor or very poor condition, stopping many from picking up a racket. 53% of those unplayable venues are in the most socially deprived areas. The Lawn Tennis Association believes 17 to 20 million pounds is needed and more government support to deal with the current deterioration in park tennis facilities. Former British number one Anne Kyothavong knows the pressure of playing tennis on the global stage and the barriers you can face on the way there. We've obviously got this brand new figurehead in Emma Raducanu. Is tennis still an elitist sport, though? Do you think it's accessible if you're from a disadvantaged background? Yeah, there are difficulties, but look, I, I grew up in Hackney and I grew up playing on park courts, so I know what that journey is all about. And, um, you know, going into performance tennis, whatever background you come from, it is not a, an easy journey. But it's not just getting more players involved in the sport, it's also retaining um, young players in the sport, which is really going to be, um, yeah, most important looking to the future. And meet Emma Raducanu's new fangirls, who before the weekend didn't even know who she was. I assume that lots of people are going to be saying, oh, you're very young, you're a woman, you can't do this. Well, she, she, she proved them wrong and she showed them that um, any age, where you, well, no, no matter where you come from or no matter how your age is, what your gender, you can still do like anything. It makes me to like carry on and play tennis and learn and learn and the skills of tennis. And how old are you? Um, 10. Will you be at the US Open in eight years, do you think? Mm, maybe. <laughs> Meanwhile, on her Instagram today, she sent her more than a million followers a postcard from New York. The girl from Bromley on the billboards before she's even old enough to legally order a drink stateside. And joining me now from New York City is tennis legend Virginia Wade, who was, of course, the last British woman to win the US Open singles title back in 1968. Virginia Wade, it's brilliant to have you on the programme. Talk me through the tension, the thrills, what was going on through your what was going on in your mind as you watched Emma Raducanu? Well, I tell you something, it's not as nerve-wracking as you think because she is so under control and hits the ball so well and seems to just dismantle all of her opponents one after another. And so I think this is, it's just been a joy watching her. And obviously this Leila Fernandez is a lovely player too. And that was a joy as well. So we had two of the most uh, desirable characters playing in the final. It was just fantastic. And one of the things that was so incredible was that the crowd just never budged after for half an hour or much more after the match because they wanted to see every last second of Emma holding her trophy. It was really lovely. And I, I, obviously, <laughs> after all that attention, I'm smiling because I know that she's going to have uh, requests from here to eternity coming up. And that, that will, but I think she'll know how to handle that. I think there's been enough experience out there on the women's tour 
And I think that she will, she's just got everything going for her. And she's just a wonderful, wonderful person, superstar. What about that moment where she had blood dripping down her knee? That must have been slightly nerve wracking for those of us who were cheering her on. Well, I mean, it was so funny because she obviously didn't really know what to do. And she looked up at her box and they said, yeah, no, no, you have to, because that's the rule now. You don't want to have any blood around. And uh, I believe that Layla was a little upset, but she had to. It was it was a nasty, it, it was an aggravated scrape and there was blood pouring down her leg. So she had to have it fixed. And, you know, I, I when she came back and... Um, I thought to myself, she's just got to go for a different big A. She's got to commit herself. She mostly likes to put a little slice in her service. Fantastic. But I thought, just go for it. And there it was. She went for it and it just was perfect. And just about everything about her and about her tournament was perfect. And what an incredible journey to go from what happened at Wimbledon to this. I, it, it, to be honest, you know, I didn't think it was such a big deal what happened at Wimbledon. These things can happen. You have to think about them. You can't just pretend they don't. It, it didn't happen. But, you know, I was a uh, coach then with Nigel Sears. And, you know, the first thing I did was I emailed him and said, you know, I just don't think this is a bad thing at all. You just move on. And uh, that's exactly what she's done. So I, I, I don't think she's going to have any ghosts from that. I mean, it's just something that might happen. You might not be feeling 100% on a day or something, and it's, it's so much pressure. And uh, stuffy conditions, you know, it was sweltering hot, and she was running from corner to corner because she, you know, she busts her gut to get to every single ball. I mean, she's so determined. And likewise, when she had that scrape on the court, because she was trying and she got to a ball that really was uh, out of reach. So that is one of the determining factors that's making her so unbelievably successful. I know you gave her a big hug at the end. What did you say to her? I, I'm, I, I said, can I have a hug? I need a hug. That was about all I said. I mean, you know, we were just, I was just Kim Kleisters who won the tournament several times. And I said, we've got to go down and see if we can just catch a glimpse of her because I know she's going to be surrounded by security people, surrounded by people who now are going to be looking after her and surrounded by the, the people like it's going to be like bees around a honey pot. But I said, I'm sure we can, you know, we play, we've got players' uh, credentials. We can just go down and maybe we'll get lucky. And we got lucky. There's going to be a huge burden of expectation on her. I mean, you've been there. How do you, how do you cope with that? Well, you have to accept there is going to be one. And I think, I think there are two things. First of all, I think she has to really realize how, how good she is. And that's not in an egotistical sort of way. That's just in being self-confident without being big-headed or anything like that. It's just like if you, know, if you believe that you're better than somebody else, you're probably going to beat them. So she's got to have a big dose of that and constantly have that. The other thing is that, you know, tennis, you always go up in stages. You go up a step and then you have to try and consolidate that. And, and look, when I say look backwards, I mean, you have to make sure you don't have any bad losses. Uh, and then you go up and, you know, bad losses, somebody ranked way lower than you that you should beat. But there are plenty of good players out there that, you know, if you don't play well against them the first match, there's always time to learn. There are half a dozen to 10 uh, uh, girls, young ladies, young women out there who are so good. So between them, I think they really are going to be uh, vying for the top honours all the time in the next five to ten years. What about the, the future Emma Raducanu's, the future Virginia Wade's? Do you think there will be more investment in tennis for kids, particularly kids from all backgrounds, to now enjoy this sport? I, I definitely think so. I mean, you know, there was such a gap in British tennis, especially... Well, both the, the the girls and the boys, actually. And, you know, when, when I was playing way back then and tennis just went open, 1968 was the first year that there was open tennis, so there was prize money. And, uh, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to win the US Open that year. But all my contemporaries, virtually all of them, ended up 
coaching in the States because they could earn some sort of living there. Whereas instead of that, we should have been recycling them in Britain so that they were giving their expertise to the next generation. So there was a huge gap way back then, 50, 40 years ago, when nothing happened and nothing happened for yeah. a long time, to be honest. Okay. But now it, it's really we reaping the benefits of what has happened Wonderful. with the Olympics and with the facilities and everything like that. Well, Virginia Wade, what a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be in this situation.